God has called us here this morning to worship Him. He has called us here because He loves us, because He loves to hear our praise, because He loves it when we get together in His name. And we are gathered here this morning because we do love Him. We do want to praise Him. We do want to please Him. We want to do what is right. We want to grow, and we want to succeed. None of us wants to fail, right? No one in this room is out looking for failure. No one out in Bowling Green this morning is out looking for failure. We have an aversion to failure. We hate it. And Jesus, knowing that, gives a teaching in Luke chapter 14 that I want you to turn with me to. And I want us to consider this morning. Luke chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 25 through 35. And and think about this passage in which Jesus is going to, to tell us to count the cost. And I'd like you to read with me, please, in Luke chapter 14. Please turn there, open with me, put a marker there if you have one. We're going to go through this passage together. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he will send a delegation and ask for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is, it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear Let him hear. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In this passage, we are told that we must hate our family. We must make sure that we have enough resources to build the whole tower from the very beginning. We're told to compare our army with that of the enemy before going into battle. If we don't want to be labeled a failure, then we need to do some homework. But I want to ask you a question as we dig into this text and as we think through it together this morning. Is Jesus' point... Is Jesus asking us to look at ourselves and decide if we are able to bear this burden? Is Jesus asking us to consider whether or not we can carry the load? I want you to think about that with me as we go through that text this morning. And I want to give you a little bit of warning about the structure of the lesson. We're going to look at this text in sort of three sections, section one, two, and three, and then we're going to sort of use some words like summary and conclusion after section three, but I still have more to go after that. Okay, so I don't want to set you up for disappointment. We're going to go through sections one, two, and three, kind of summarize it a little bit, and then look at why he talks about salt at the end, okay? So let's look first at section one. Section 1 is verses 25 through 27, and I want to read that with you again. I know we just did, but I want to read this small section and this kind of look at what it says to us about this idea of becoming a disciple of Jesus and how we want to be ready for that. 
Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, if you're not familiar with the teachings of Jesus, if you have not spent much time in the Word of God, this is going to be shocking to you. And for those of us who are Christians, it may be that if someone called us out about what is Jesus saying here, we might stammer around a little bit trying to understand or try to finagle our way around. But this might be one of those situations in which the way in which he uses language is different from the way in which we would use language. And so we look at other passages in the Bible which clearly teaches us, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Children, honor your parents and the Lord for this is right. And so it might help us to look at a parallel passage, another one of the Gospels that gives us the same teaching but uses different words to help us. So in Matthew chapter 18, or Matthew chapter 10, excuse me, in verse 37, Matthew, as he records his Gospel, also being guided by the Holy Spirit, writes it for us this way, right? Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. It's, it's an issue of comparison. Who do you love more? Who would you choose if you were forced to choose? And Jesus is here telling us that the first test we need to pass is to make sure, is to look within and decide and determine that we love Jesus more than anyone else in the whole world. As we consider becoming a disciple of His, that's what this is about, right? And that's why we're here. As we consider becoming a disciple of Jesus, we cannot make our decision based on what our family has done, is doing, or will do. This is not one of those times where we call a family conference and we have a vote. Regardless of what my family is doing, I must decide that Jesus is more important. Now, I want all of my family to follow Jesus. And I want all of your family to follow Jesus. And I love to read in the account of Acts about Cornelius and his household. Right, obeyed the gospel. Lydia and her household obeyed the gospel. I love to read those stories, and we love to see families who are all together committed to the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, oftentimes we have to choose. And even for those of us who are believers, there are times where we have to make choices. And I must be willing to commit myself to Jesus and to follow Jesus and to take up my own cross and go after Christ. And perhaps for some of you, you've had to take up your own cross and bear it on a very lonely road. But you do it gladly because you have determined, you believe, you have found Jesus to be worth it. And He is. And Peter and the other close disciples of Jesus, those whom we call the Twelve, they give us a great example about what this looks like, right? Because when Jesus went to them and said, follow me, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they left where they were, they left what they were doing, and they left who they were with, and they followed Jesus. And Peter brings this up to Jesus on another occasion. In Matthew chapter 19, if you've got a marker, leave it here in Luke 14. But in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is going to be teaching a different message, but Peter's going to receive the same truth that we're discussing here this morning. And in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, Peter is going to say, See, we have left everything and followed you. 
What then will we have? Peter says, we did that. We decided, Jesus, that you were worth it. And we left everything behind and we followed you. Now what will come of that? And Jesus responds in agreement with Peter. But I want you to notice perhaps what Jesus emphasizes here, at least, at least the way in which he phrases this, the order in which he states it. Peter says, we left everything and followed you. And Jesus says, then in verse 28, truly I say to you, in the new world when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 thrones of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Jesus says, you followed me. Jesus says, you did this for my name's sake. So the part that I want to emphasize this morning from section 1 of our text in Luke 14 is not how we can do a better job of hating our family. Right? Because that's not Jesus' point, is it? Jesus' point is that we look at Him. We focus on Him. We get to know Him. And as we do so, our longing for Him becomes so much greater than our longing and desire for anyone or anything else. We pursue Jesus regardless of what it costs us because He is worth it. That's what I believe Jesus is telling us in the first part, section 1 of our text this morning about what it means to be a disciple of His. We have decided, we have found that He is worth it. Look with me now at section 2. Section 2 is back in Luke chapter 14. Now picking up in verse 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him. This man began to build and was not able to finish. What is Jesus trying to get across here? What, what is Jesus' point? Is he telling us that we need to save more money before we begin building our house? Is this simply a point of wisdom that we might find in the Proverbs or some other part of the, the Old Testament where we have this principle about saving or preparedness? Is Jesus perhaps pointing to the fact that we have a tendency towards laziness? We have a tendency not to follow through. Knox was just pointing out to me yesterday, we start a lot of projects and we don't really finish them. <laughs> Is Jesus trying to indicate that we need to go to the ant as a sluggard and we need to observe the ant's hardworking ways before we can pretend to be a good disciple? Let's look at section 3, and let's consider them together. Section 3, verses 31 and 32. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. What's Jesus trying to teach us here? Is Jesus telling us that we need to build a bigger army or make an alliance with a fellow army so that we can have enough to withstand the enemy? If we think about this in spiritual terms, is Jesus telling us that we need to call a meeting with the devil and ask for some sort of peace treaty? Is Jesus telling us not to become a disciple until we are strong enough to overcome every temptation? What's Jesus' point? Well, what does he say in verse 33? What's his conclusion? What's his summary in, in, in considering these two illustrations that he puts before us? 
Does he say, so save up more money? Does he say, so gather more resources? Exercise your willpower so that you'll be prepared. Jesus says in Luke chapter 14 and verse 33, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. The solution is quite the opposite of what you would expect. Rather than build up and acquire and gain, he says to renounce. You have to renounce everything. And the thing that I want to bring up for your consideration this morning is that we have to even be willing to renounce our desire to appear successful in every particular. We have to give up the desire that we have to look before others as though we have it all together. And I want you to consider with me in thinking about this idea, Peter, who we brought up just a moment ago. Peter and the other disciples who did give up so much, who gave up a great deal and was recognized for Jesus for do, by Jesus for doing so. We are also told, if we spend time reading through the Gospels, about many of the failures of Peter. And I didn't sit down and add up the failures of Peter versus the successes of Peter, but they're probably going to be pretty comparable. The gospel does not hide those things from us, does it? And I want to ask you this morning, would Peter have been a better disciple if he hadn't have failed? Would the cause of Christ have been more fully carried out if Peter had not messed up the way that he did? And I would like to suggest to you, no. And the reason I say that is because Jesus knew everything. He knew who Peter was. He knew how Peter would respond in those various circumstances. He knew what Peter would do. And he chose him anyway. Or perhaps we might say, he chose him because of that. Jesus knew what Peter would do, and he chose him. And the reason this sermon was on my heart already is because as I thought about this idea, as I thought about Peter and his failure and Jesus choosing him anyway and what that might say, I thought to myself, Jesus would have never chose me. Because I'm far too cautious. I am far too indecisive. I am far too calculated. And I worry that I misapply this passage from Luke chapter 14 over and over again. The reality is that God accepts our humble but eager pursuit of Him regardless of the bumps along the way. Do you remember that Jesus told his disciples that he wanted them to become like children? Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We can think of a number of qualities that children have that we need to have as God's disciples but here, I want to just think about this idea of a humble pursuit, right? A humble pursuit that a child has for that next step, for that next stage of development, for the next thing that they need or want, the humble pursuit that we see in a child, because children stumble and fall a lot. If you've had toddlers in your home, you've had the desire to go buy foam padding and cover every surface in your home because children fall a lot. They get these crazy, nasty bumps and bruises on their heads. You're constantly watching them and worried that somehow they're going to break everything. But they get up and they take the next step. They stand up and they wobble and they try again. They have a humble pursuit and then before you know it, they're running faster than you are. Little boys will see a rabbit in the yard and for the 100th time they will chase that rabbit fully expecting to catch it. They engage in a humble pursuit of something that they see before them that is of interest regardless 
of past experience or who's watching them or what the outcome will be. If we were to read in our Old Testaments, we would find that it was a young girl who took a step of faith and told a foreign army captain where he could go to be healed of his leprosy. If we read another story from the life of Jesus, we'll learn that it was a little boy who offered up five loaves and two fish when the question was come, how are we going to feed these 5,000 people? And while I acknowledge that Peter had some problems and that it may have been some confidence that was in himself instead of in Jesus and the plan that caused him to put himself out there on some of those occasions, I would like to suggest to you this morning that also it was a childlike faith that Peter had that claimed that he would go to the death with Jesus. God wants us to put ourselves out there for him. So what is Jesus saying when he tells us to count the cost? If he's not telling us to be calculating and cautious. When Jesus says that we must hate our family, he is telling us that we must humbly accept that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's worth whatever I have to give up, wherever I have to go, and whoever I lose along the way. Jesus is worth it. Secondly, I believe that he's telling us that when we go to build a temple, or excuse me, a tower, we need to recognize, I don't have the resources to get this done. I don't have what it takes. If I try to build a tower on my own, I'm going to end up just like those people back in Genesis chapter 11 who were scattered and this temple is left to ruins. Okay, when I think about this idea of building something that is worthy and worthwhile, I don't have the resources. I've got to turn somewhere else. When I compare my army with the army of the enemy, I have to realize that the enemy is too powerful for me to overcome. The devil is too cunning, too crafty. He has too many uh, weapons at his disposal. If it's up to me, I'm toast. What I have to see from Jesus' teaching here is that I need him. I need Jesus. I'll never make it on my own. I'll be left a failure. I need Jesus. Jesus is not asking me to consider if I am strong enough, if I can bury the burden, if I can carry the load, because the obvious answer is, I can't. Only He can. He doesn't end it all by telling us to get stronger. He tells us to accept Him. He's the one who will love us better than anyone else can love us. He's the one who will provide all the resources we need, and He will lead us to victory. In fact, He already has. But then, Jesus offers this lesson on salt. Luke records for us here at the end of this text something about salt. And I want you to think with me for a minute what he's trying to say and why it fits in here. Salt is good. Luke chapter 14, verse 34. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now again, just like with the reference to children that, that we made earlier, there could be a number of ways we understand that. So when we think about this idea of being the salt of the earth, we can talk about a number of things. Being a preservative, adding flavor, various things. But at the risk of embarrassment, I want you to take this on a little bit of a surface level for me. And, and when I thought about this in my mind, I thought about like the 80s surfer dude voice, right? Hey man, why are you using so much salt? I don't know, dude, because it's like so salty. Right? I love the way the NIV puts this. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
Why do you like salt? Because it's salty, right? It does what it's supposed to do, and nothing else can take its place. You, you, you can replace the Italian with the oregano, those little spices in the cabinet. You can, you know, you can do the cayenne pepper. You can pick the chili powder. You can mix some different things together. But if you don't have salt, it just doesn't taste right, right? Salt is there because it fills this unique space. It has an essence about it. My son Knox, right? If you don't know my son Knox, we, we, we all have this, but I, I just want to use his name because it sounds cool with this illustration. My son Knox has his Noxiness, right? He has an essence about him. And if he were to lose his Noxiness, he would not be a different person. He would be a nobody. Right? If, if I lost my Joshiness, I would, I would not be a different person. I would be a nobody. Okay? We are made uniquely by God just the way that we are. And we're intended to fill that unique space in his creation. Each of us are made uniquely by God, but we all have one purpose. When he says... Don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose what it is about you that makes you you. But I want to give you a warning, right? Because the world tells us all the time, we need to find ourselves. We need to be our unique person. That's not what this is. Okay, you need to be the unique person that God is calling you to be. And that involves bearing His image. Okay? If I lose my Christ-following, image-bearing reflection of God, I lose myself. And I am lost forever. If I give up on the image-bearing following of Christ, I've lost my essence. I've given up the very thing that makes me human and that makes me me. That's why there's so many people in the world trying to find themselves who are completely lost and have no idea even where to begin. They don't know the first things about themselves because they aren't looking in the right place. God tells us who we are. God made us how we are. And if we look to Him and we follow Him, we'll find our purpose, right? So what God is saying to us is, be true, not only to yourself, be true to your purpose, what He has called us to be. Don't lose your saltiness. I want you to conclude with me this morning in Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 28 through 34 in just a second. Jesus is going to tell his disciples, You are those who stayed with me in my trials. All right, now, now, hold on to that, right? He doesn't say, You disciples are the ones who were perfect. You said all the right words and you did all the right things. No, you are the ones who stayed with me through my trials. And I assigned to you a kingdom. But he's going to go on to tell Peter, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. You've stayed with me through my trials. Peter, I've prayed for you because Satan's going to seek after you, but I, I don't want your faith to fail. But what do we know? What do we know is about to happen? Within hours of Jesus saying this, Peter's going to deny that he even knows who Jesus is three times. So did Peter fail? Did Peter's faith fail? Did Jesus' prayer fail? I want to read this passage with you. Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 28. And I want to tell you from the beginning what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this passage and then I'm going to take a couple of sentences from the middle of it and I'm going to read them again at the end. Okay? So I want you to begin with me in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 28. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. 
that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Perhaps it is that you're here this morning and you're at a point in your life where you realize that Jesus is worth it. We would love nothing more than for you to come and let everyone else here know that you've made that decision. And you are ready to commit yourself to Him by being buried with Him in baptism. If you're someone who has seen that you faltered, as Peter did, but you understand that failure is not final for the Christian. As long as you're living and breathing, God is calling you back. And if you want the help and encouragement of this group, we would love to pray for you, to encourage you, to strengthen, to join with you, and humbly pursuing Jesus. If you have any need, please come to the front while we stand and sing.